What does it mean to plan a business venture seven generations ahead? You see, Thomas Benjo has been thinking this way for quite some time. He's one of the leading forces with the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce. He's also a member of CBC's Future 40. And what Thomas is envisioning is a much different future for business, not only here in Canada, but also how Indigenous communities are going to play a greater role. On this edition of the Leadership Standard, we say hello and welcome to Thomas Benjo. And Thomas, uh, right away, I am so intrigued, and I think a lot of our listeners are intrigued as well, by anyone who would sit down and actually conceptualize a business model seven generations ahead. Can you elaborate on that? Thanks, Gary. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, we, we go back to the values of, uh, you know, our ancestors and, and uh, you know, our, our nations that uh, we, we work for. And uh, our, our value system is is very, very critical in, in the way that we think and the way that we bring Indigenous knowledge and, and thought forward. And so when we think about conceptualizing seven generations ahead in our, our businesses and, and how we function, um, we're often thinking about what can we do to create the greatest impact. And so when we think about developing a new business, um, whether that's with partners or if we're acquiring a new company, um, inside of those organizations, it is very, very important and critical that we manage the governance of that organization and that we become the visionaries within those organizations so that uh, we set up the foundation of that organization <clears throat> so that it is successful well into the future. And we also think about, um, you know, what does success look like? Is it financial? Is it um, employment? Is it, um, you know, the, the, the reinvestment that we make into our communities? And, you know, we think about all of these things and, and they become uh, a part of, of the long-term thinking uh, within that, uh, that organization. And so, when we plan out this process, it is very, very important for us to um, think about what is what is the world going to look like around us. And um, we we do this through um, consultation with our um, communities, with the business community around us, and and we um, you know take the time to uh, you know really plan out uh, how we're going to get there as. Uh, uh, you know, as we develop um, the, the capacity within that particular company. Thomas, you're the president and CEO of FHQ Developments, and uh, it would be tempting, I guess, to call you an incubator, if you will, a business incubator, but how would you describe exactly what FHQ does and the role you play in successfully helping to launch uh, organizations? Well, I, I think, you know, it, it took us some time, but we, we took a step back and like I said, seven generation thinking. So we have to think about how, how is our foundation set and what, what are the things that we can do to create the greatest impact in, in the community and, and not just our own First Nations communities, but how do we create a greater impact in the economy as, as a whole? And so some of the things that, that we've done in order to be successful in business is, uh, you know, we, we try to work within an economy where um, our thinking is being um, compared to other organizations that exist. And what we're trying to get our customers to understand is that our thinking is, is much broader. And, and so in order for them to come along on the journey with us, we have to have deeper discussions with those customers. We have to get into their mindsets and say, what are you doing as an organization to support seven generation thinking? What are you doing as an organization to change policy, to affect business? And uh, how do you make sure that that's sustainable? Because if we look at the way that we think um, about how capitalism works in this world, um, there's a very finite amount of resources that we have available to us. And we consume, we consume as, as capitalists, we consume every resource possible for um, bottom line. But in our thinking and in our, our value system, um, if we look at the way that indigenous people have lived around the world, 
um, we only take what we need and, and we share. We make sure that there is um, communal benefit to um, the wealth that we either uh, develop for ourselves and we make sure that we take care of those that uh, you know are, are not given the, the same blessings that, that uh, we would be given. And so we have to be able to think of others uh, when we're developing this sustainable model. And so it's, uh, it's about going on a journey together, uh, but making sure that um, everyone is able to travel with us on that journey. So when I sit back and look at, and I'm just thinking like anyone who would be curious to know more about FHQ, is the goal, uh, so maybe a two-part question here, Thomas, is the goal economic independence? And if so, how is that achieved? Uh, and is it different for an Indigenous community? Uh, I, I'm just curious to know. Absolutely. Um, economic independence is, is at the core of our organization and that's why we exist. Um, you know, if we look at the way that uh, the current systems are, are set up for Indigenous um, uh, communities across Canada, um, we're often at the whim of uh, federal policy, uh, federal funding, and, uh, you know, nobody has any pride in having to, um, you know, depend on uh, the financial resources or, or the policies of, um, of government. Uh, we, our nations want to be able to exercise their inherent and treaty rights to be able to uh, make decisions that best fit their community. You know, they want to be able to um, make decisions and invest in things that they know absolutely is going to help advance their uh, community forward. And we don't want to have to do that in, in such a way where we have to go to the government with a proposal and say, hey, do you think you can fund this and, and uh, you know, end up having to um, adjust our plans or adjust our, our, our goals in order for it to fit government policy. That is not an effective way to govern ourselves. And, you know, no, um, no nation in, in the world uh, would conduct themselves in that way. And so how do we do this effectively? Well, we need economic independence. We need to be able to generate our own source revenue so that we can make those decisions so that our nations have that flexibility to make those decisions for themselves and to um, focus on what matters most to them and that they're coming up with their own solutions to how um, they get over some of the, you know, consistent uh, issues that we deal with on an annual basis as nations uh, within Canada. Thomas, I, I would love to know uh, the origin story where you woke up with this. Where, can you bring our listeners back to the moment uh, where you had that epiphany yourself? You're a young man at some point. What was it about what you experienced that led you to this realization that economic independence was the answer? Well, uh, the way that we operate within our company is we're, we're a team. Um, this thought, this process uh, came from, uh, you know, the, the consultation that was done with our communities, the consultation that was done with our, our life speakers or our elders, um, our leadership, our, our chiefs, our, our tribal chief, um, our, our board of directors, this thinking is all throughout uh, our organization as, as a tribal council. Mm -hmm. And so when we, you know, take that time to consult and, and take that time to use ceremony and, and understanding and, and bringing our value system um, into these processes, uh, it helps to provide more clarity on what is actually important for us. Why, why is economic independence so important for us and, and how do we make sure that we understand and do that in such a way that we're not taking away uh, too much from our, our mother, our mother earth, um, but doing this in such a way uh, that ensures that we are helping to take care of our loved ones and helping to take care of our, our neighbors and our, our treaty uh, allies within our territory. At a very personal level, Thomas Benjo, as a young man, must have had a moment where he realized this, shall we call it, 
philosophical awakening. Can you bring us back to the moment where it happened? What were the circumstances? You know, I've, I've always thought, uh, you know, about my community since I was uh, very young. I've always thought of myself as, uh, you know, a servant to um, our people. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's about how, how do I um, do something that can create the greatest effect uh, for our people and, and um, you know, make livelihood uh, that much better. And so it, it was um, through that thinking and, and through um, teachings from my, my grandfather um, that, uh, you know, awakened myself to um, think about these types of things and, and think about how, what's, what's the best way that I can affect that, that change. And, um, you know, when I was growing up and decided to uh, pursue post-secondary education, I felt and, and was pushed um, from, you know, leaders in, in my community to consider business. And, you know, it, it was the discussion around why economic development is, is so important and uh, being, able for, uh, being able for us to, to realize our, our true potential. And, um, you know, we, we need uh, financial resources to be able to uh, accomplish the things that we need to do in, in this world. And so, um, you know, business is the best place to start. And, and so I, I guess this, this visionary um, uh, has, has really come from just, um, you know, uh, working with a lot of our, our elders and, and uh, life speakers and, and, you know, listening to those uh, uh, stories and, and uh, creating an understanding and uh, being able to bring that into, uh, uh, you know, the, the Western world and, and um, you know, bringing that uh, Indigenous uh, knowledge and, and thought into these processes. Is there a specific story, maybe it's from your grandfather, another elder, another mentor, that really spoke to you? Uh, I, I would love to hear that very specific story that frames the issue uh, that you speak of with respect to economic independence. I, I think it was, you know, just the, the, the teachings from my grandfather. He, uh, um, he always gave. Um, everything that he did, he gave. If he had, you know, his last twenty dollars in his wallet, he was going to give you. If it meant that um, it was going to help that individual in, in their livelihood, um, that that thought about giving and and uh, you know has has always stuck with me. And and so, you know, when I think about um, giving and and uh, you know serving our, our nations, it's. Uh, it's through business and, and being able to give it a much larger level. Um, and so when we think about the businesses that, that we own and the individuals that we choose to lead those organizations, these are some of the really critical values that, that they have to carry with them as well. And uh, think about, you know, how, how do we make this world just a little bit better and, and how do we um, uh, make the livelihood just a little bit more better for um, our, our Indigenous uh, members of, of our communities. I can't help but wonder, did your grandfather have, for instance, a business background? Uh, no, he was, uh, well, he's, he, I guess he is an entrepreneur technically, he's a farmer, um, but uh, there wasn't a day, and, and even today we just celebrated, uh, it's actually his birthday today, so uh, we were able to share a piece of cake last last night and uh, uh, with him, but uh, you know it, it's just those uh, really uh, core values of um, thinking about others before we think about ourselves, and uh, you know trying to improve uh, livelihood for those around us. And, and I think Thomas, you know, you and I are not going to solve all the problems of of the world in one podcast. However, is there one thing that the rest of Canada, other Canadians, don't understand about the circumstances and the challenges faced by Indigenous communities, Indigenous entrepreneurs trying to uh, seek what you're out to achieve? Well, I, I think, you know, one of the big issues that we're always trying to change is, is policy. Policy around Indigenous engagement, policy around Indigenous procurement, 
And, you know, a lot of times we, we face a lot of organizations and they often ask, well, why? Why is this so important? Why do we need to make these changes? Why do we need to give Indigenous businesses an opportunity to participate? Or why do we um, give them certain opportunities to, uh, um, you know, be, be given uh, work? And, you know, when we think about uh, the, the history of, of uh, you know, the establishment of of Canada and even uh, the United States, um, you know, when they were negotiating treaty, uh, we gave up land, we gave up, um, uh, you know, our livelihood on, on the land to be able to share uh, with settlers at, at that time. And, uh, you know, oftentimes, and, uh, you know, I heard this recently, um, you know, from um, another very prominent Indigenous speaker, but uh, he made a really interesting point around um, you know, we, we often get the stories about, you know, um, settlers talking about uh, my, my grandfather came here with, you know, a couple dollars in their, their pocket and, you know, they came and they settled and they worked hard on the land and they developed, you know, this, this wealth and developed this, these assets for our families. And um, that's, you know, that's, that's not the whole truth. Uh, when we look at how land was settled uh, throughout North America uh, and, around the world. Um, but, you know, in particular within Canada, um, every settler that, uh, you know, chose to settle within, especially Western Canada, which is where our nations are, are located, um, they were given 640 acres, 640 acres. So you weren't just, you didn't just have a couple bucks in your pocket, you were given land, you were given economic opportunity to participate in the Canadian economy. And now what we're asking as Indigenous organizations is we were not allowed to participate in the economy. We were either disenfranchised or uh, we uh, were not able to sell our livestock, sell our crops. Uh, we had pass and permit systems in place. So there is a historical, uh, many historical issues that uh, we've had to overcome. And things that my grandfather had to overcome, my, my family has a history of this. And uh, so now, you know, we're using our rights, we're using our knowledge to be able to challenge the system. And what we're doing is we're also challenging the thinking now. We're trying to teach organizations why this is important because you can't say that your grandfathers were not given opportunity in the economy when they were, they were given, given land. Um, to the detriment of Indigenous nations. And now what we're saying is, well, we want to be able to participate. So now it's time for you to make changes to your policies to allow us to participate. You know, give us that opportunity. Otherwise, I mean, you could give us, uh, you know, 640 acres of land. I mean, we would we would take that as well. I mean, 640 acres of land, as, as we know today, I mean, that's, uh, uh, that's worth uh, quite a penny today. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm listening to you, Thomas, and I just, I love your spirit of optimism balanced with some of the cold, hard facts and, and the brutal truth of, of what has happened. But you're looking forward and what that speaks to is something we always want to explore deeper on the leadership standard is your own personal leadership journey. Was there a moment maybe when, when, I don't know, through university or, or whatever, but when I look at your track record, I look at your accolades, I look at your accomplishments, I see, well, there's a leadership journey. Can you bring us back, Thomas, to when that leadership journey began? In other words, when did you realize, hey, wait a second, I'm a leader and responsible for others other than myself? I, I think it was through the, you know, very, very unique education that I was able to gain through First Nations University of Canada. Um, the, the, you know, programs that have been developed and, and the courses that uh, have been created and uh, the, the learning opportunities that we had from learning from um, a lot of our, our life speakers and, and elders within uh, the institution. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't gain that level of education in, in another post-secondary institution. Um, it's just not as ingrained. And so, um, you know, it was through participating in, in that um, post-secondary setting, uh, meeting the people that I, I had the opportunity to meet, listening and, and participating in, in ceremony and, and 
understanding and, and listening. Um, that is such a key, um, you know, piece of advice that I, I give uh, so many individuals is you always have to take the time to listen. And don't just listen for the things that you're looking for, listen for the things that excite people. Um, when I think about our, our elders from our, our communities, there are things that they are specialists in. There are things that they have deep knowledge about. And so when you take that time to understand what it is that they're trying to tell you, or they'll, they'll always do things in, in story format in order for you to learn a lesson. Um, when you take that time to listen and unlock some of that uh, information, um, it, it helps you to think differently. And, and so, you know, through, um, you know, my, my own personal journey, if, if, I, if I'm ever engaged in a room, I'm the last person to speak. I'm always the last person to speak. And I, I do that for a reason. And it's because I want to be able to listen, to learn, to understand everybody's perspectives before I decide what my perspective should be. And so it's, it's trying to provide, you know, greater clarity and, and taking into consideration, which is a part of our value system as Indigenous people is using communal thought and, and respecting communal knowledge and being able to harness that and, and uh, uh, you know, deliver strategy based on, based on what you've heard. Um, so it's such a, a critical uh, piece. And I think just by learning how to harness that, I think that that has really helped me in, in my leadership journey. And so I just, I always, uh, you know, take great effort to be um, the best listener in the room. The best listener in the room, which segues beautifully into the question around influences and mentors. You've mentioned a few times already the significance of elders such as your grandfather, but just tell us about the role and some of the people you'd like to single out who have been key influences or mentors on your leadership journey. Well, one of my, uh, one of my greatest mentors, um, obviously my, my grandfather has, has played a significant role in my life, but I also have, um, you know, our, our tribal chief, uh, Edmund Belgard, uh, of the File Hills Capel Tribal Council, who is also the, the chair of FHQ Developments. Um, I have great respect uh, for his knowledge and thought. And, um, you know, he's, he's another uh, great individual that, uh, you know, I would encourage people to, uh, to follow and, and to listen. Um, but he's, uh, he's helped me in, in many different ways. He was the... Uh, he was the initial, uh, you know, he was the individual that plucked me out of the university seat and said, hey, um, you know, we want to see you as a uh, uh, board of directors member with this new company that we're starting called FHQ Developments. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to take the time to uh, uh, help you along your journey, your career and uh, develop the experience as a board member. And uh, so I, I, you know, I owe a lot to uh, his forward thinking and making sure that there was, uh, you know, a youth uh, mindset around the table uh, with great uh, uh, board of directors members that, that we've had over the years. Um, you know, and oftentimes, you know, you sit there as, as, a, as a young 20 year old thinking, oh, I'm sitting in the room with giants and, uh, you know, how do I, how do I make sure that I, I take the time to harness as much information as, pol as possible? And, and uh, how do I make sure that I, I make them proud at the end of the day when uh, it is time to uh, make the decisions as, as a leader? So I, I owe a great uh, amount of uh, gratitude to, to Edmund. And, uh, you know, we, we have, um, I have a lot of other, uh, you know, leaders that I go to, a lot of um, uh, men and, and women leaders. Uh, it, it all depends on uh, what it is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble with or, or uh, need that extra support around, but I've always made sure to surround myself uh, with some of the best in, in uh, Indigenous business and, and the best in, in non-Indigenous business. And that only helps me to uh, build a, a greater understanding of, uh, you know, um, greater level thinking, I, I guess, in, in business. Thomas, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about FHQ and some of the exciting projects you're involved in, but how would you, it's a favorite question on this podcast, how would you define leadership in 30 seconds or less? 
If I was to define leadership in 30 seconds, it would be um, it would be the listener. Uh, like I said, listening is, is so critical and, and so important. Um, if, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, you, you have uh, different leaders that, uh, you know, like to spend a, a lot of the time trying to fill the empty space with, with words, but it's, it's your deep thinkers, your deep thought. Uh, it's those leaders that take the time to really try to understand and um, I, I, so critical uh, to, to be a great listener and, and to uh, um, understand uh, the world around us and, and the situations that, that we're placed in. I do want to, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about FHQ a little bit, but I also um, have to ask this. They say on any leadership journey that there is no better teacher than failure. Is there something you have failed at or struggled with and it made you better in the long run? Yeah, we, we deal with uh, failure all the time. I mean, uh, I, I'm an individual that likes to set high expectations. And so, um, yes, there are the frustrating days, but, uh, you know, you come back, you re-strategize, you uh, connect, you network, and you come back with another strategy and you try to figure out, and especially being in, uh, within an Indigenous organization and being Indigenous myself, um, I'm being challenged all the time on my thinking on, um, you know, why uh, what it is that we do is, is so important and, you know, challenging the, the thought process of other leaders. And, and sometimes uh, people can be a little stubborn in, in uh, you know, their, their decision making processes. But, you know, I take the time to listen and to understand where their thought process is coming from, then I re-strategize and I come back and I try to, uh, you know, overcome some of those issues. And, um, but I mean, failure is, uh, it's, it's important to fail as, as fast as you can so that you can re-strategize and uh, uh, come back with, uh, with another way to uh, overcome some of those challenges. Is there a specific story you can tell? Like one of those things that, geez, you wish you had a do-over? Um, I, I think, well, one, one of the key ones, I, I guess, uh, that, that, you know, is, is just in, in managing people. I, I think that is uh, probably one of the most critical as, as any leader is, um, you know, I, I have uh, great respect for, um, uh, being able to work with people and, and that's been, you know, one of my most challenging and, um, was you know making the decisions to uh, change out the team members is uh, a little quicker and um, I know that uh, you know there was a lot of lessons in in not making those choices sooner um, that I wish I had definitely had a do over um, but uh, you know I I always value and and uh, acknowledge the the lessons that that we do learn in those instances and. Um, I often go back to, you know, our, our value system is uh, based on, um, you know, things will happen for a reason. And it's up to you to decide on um, what you're going to do with that situation or how you're going to treat um, dealing with those situations in, in the future. And so um, there's always a lesson to be learned. And sometimes, um, you know, you know, we're constantly out there trying to win new contracts and grow the business. And, um, you know, that's, that's always, you know, the, the goal of ours, but, you know, sometimes we don't win. Um, but we have to, and, and I talk, I, I share this with, with our leaders all the time within our organization, you know, our general managers of our companies. And I, I share with them, I, I let them know that, even though we didn't win that contract, that might've been a, for a good reason. You know, there, um, we, we have uh, people looking out for us. And so, um, you know, both here and, and uh, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, through our ceremony, we, we have our, our ancestors that watch over us. And so when something doesn't necessarily go our way, it's, it's, not, um, it's not always uh, because we don't deserve it it's because it just might not have been the right time. Mm -hmm. It just might not have been the right thing for us at that point in time. And so we respect that. We learn from it and then we come back around and, and uh, um, build that understanding around it. 
I'm just, uh, I can't help but think, uh, Thomas, that that part and parcel is that seven generations ahead thinking. Now, I did promise, and I want to make it absolutely clear, this is going to be a bit of a shameless self-promotional plug for FHQ, because I know you've got some exciting projects you're working on. I think people would be curious to know just some of the, the companies you're helping to get off the ground and be you know, become economically independent with sustainable business models? Yeah, well, one one of the key businesses that we have that we just started uh, within the past year has been uh, Plato SaaS testing. Um, it was, you know, a new step for us. We're, we're the first uh, Indigenous Dev Corp to uh, participate in the tech industry within Saskatchewan. Um, and it just so happens that uh, the software testing company that we created, well, we're the only software testing, dedicated software testing company in Saskatchewan. And through great relationships and, and through uh, understanding and, and uh, you know, looking at the overall impact that, that our business creates, um, we've been able to uh, see great uh, strides within the industry and, and uh, tremendous growth. Uh, we just started another uh, set of uh, training. Uh, we have, you know, more Indigenous um, uh, software testers being trained as we speak. And, you know, we're going to continue to grow and expand that business. And, uh, you know, we're, uh, the, the nice thing about our business is it's not just, uh, our clients aren't just here in, in Saskatchewan. We have clients in Alberta and Ontario and, you know, we're, we're growing into, uh, into other markets and we're making quite uh, quite a name for ourselves, but it's, uh, it's exciting to be in that industry. And it's more exciting that, um, you know, our, our focus there was to make sure that indigenous individuals were participating in the tech sector. And we get to be at the forefront of that in Saskatchewan. So that's um, super, super exciting for us. Yeah, and it just uh, makes me think, is there a particular client story, uh, Thomas, that has really touched your heart? Uh, that's made you recognize on a very personal level the significance of the work that you're doing? Well, I, I think, you know, on a lot of our, our businesses, uh, we, we often get uh, the opportunity to, uh, you know, have a discussion about how business is going and, and uh, you know, where we're taking uh, this organization. And um, one of the things that you know, we've been able to demonstrate as an organization that has really set us apart now um, is uh, we always talk about creating economic impact. And when we go through that journey of talking with our customers and, and getting them to understand what we mean by creating economic impact in, in uh, the way that we do business, um, there's often great learnings and, and understanding of uh, why our business is so different from other organizations. And, you know, one of the really interesting things that, that we've developed as an organization that is uh, super unique to us uh, as compared to other Indigenous uh, development corporations across Canada um, is we've actually developed a tool that measures our total economic impact um, from our, all of our businesses right down to the uh, contracts that we have based on our business model. So, uh, you know, it's always exciting to see uh, customers get very excited about saying, hey, well, if we do, you know, if we work with you and, and we establish this contract with you, um, you know, we're able to show them in dollar figures what that economic impact is going to be to the uh, Saskatchewan economy. So it's, it, it's in those stories that uh, I, I know, um, you know, everyone is, is quite excited to hear and and it's definitely a new way to think about uh, to think about business in general. And so, um, you know, that by having the greatest impact in in uh, uh, Saskatchewan, um, we're able to uh, better show other businesses, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, um, how changes to their business model could affect positively our, our economy in the future. Thomas, incredibly, you're also one of the very first Tech Canada members we've ever featured here on the Leadership Standard. So when you talk about 
the power of leadership and the power of listening to others, you get probably get no better opportunity than being part of a Tech Canada group out there in Regina, Saskatchewan with Linda Allen Hardesty. Tell us a little bit about that experience and what being around a peer uh, group of CEOs does in, in terms of your ability to listen to understand, but also find out solutions and discover ideas from others. Yeah, thanks, Gear. Um, I, I think, you know, some of the greatest lessons I, I get to learn is, is definitely from uh, my peers. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate the, uh, uh, the, the speakers that, that are, um, you know, that we get the opportunity to listen to and um, just being able to, to sit back and, and listen and, and listen to what excites those speakers, listen to what excites those entrepreneurs. Um, it's that drive and I, I always look for what is that secret sauce that, uh, you know, makes the leader sitting next to me uh, tick? What makes their business so successful? Um, what have they done differently? And, uh, you know, how has their leadership style, um, you know, created opportunities for them? Or how have they used that style to overcome issues within their company? Um, so taking that time to listen and, and understand uh, all of those varying uh, aspects of, of uh, their business and, and uh, you know, the, the level of experience that uh, a lot of the speakers share and, um, you know, has, has, you know, helped me tremendously as, as, a, as a young leader. Um, you know, this has been uh, some of the, the, the greatest experiences uh, for me because, um, you know, it, there's been a lot of issues that, I haven't dealt with yet or issues that my peers have dealt with that I'm now dealing with. And, uh, you know, I, I had a go-to solution for how to, uh, how to deal with those situations. And so it's just, uh, you know, it's appreciative that uh, there is that peer group, but also uh, a tremendous coach uh, in behind that uh, challenges my thinking and, and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, I've asked myself all of the questions that I need to ask and, and uh, you know, um, and being forced to ask the, uh, or, or at least answer some of the toughest questions that, uh, you know, some of my, uh, my management team otherwise wouldn't uh, place on me. So um, I, I truly appreciate that experience. How important do you think it is, Thomas, for fellow CEOs who might be watching or listening to have other CEOs put your feet to the fire? You know, it's, uh, I, I think it's just, you know, such a, a, a good experience um, to be able to challenge others that uh, think at very high levels. Um, and it gives you the confidence as, as a leader um, that you know, you're able to challenge people that you may have uh, otherwise felt uh, the inability to challenge if you were to meet with them face to face, or if you were to meet with them one to one as um, you know outside of uh, the the tech group. Um, so I, I think it's you know just it's about developing that that confidence and, and capacity to be able to uh, uh, challenge thinking at the greatest levels. It's been said that there's a special bond that develops among Tech Canada peer groups. Can you speak to that a little bit, elaborate? Uh, almost without betraying the secrets, take us inside that little, uh, that little inside clubhouse. I, I you know, I, I really appreciate the, the level of care uh, that is given, the level of respect that is given and, and understanding, um, you know, and, it's always good to know that when you are being challenged with some of the most uh, difficult situations in, in business or in life, um, that uh, you know you you have peers around you that are doing it from such a good place. Um, they're not doing this to to harm you or to degrade you. This is um, purely to help you uh, become better at what it is that you do. Thomas, uh, we're going to get up close and personal here on the Leadership Standard. On a scale of 1 to 10, how weird are you? <laughs> how weird am I? Um, I would say maybe a 6. What books are you reading right now? 
Uh, I'm uh, actually reading um, uh, What Matters. So it's, uh, it's about OKRs. What's the latest and favorite addition to your playlist? Uh, I'm, I'm a country fan. Uh, just added uh, 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 parody uh, song from him. If you could pick one specific room in your house that resonates with you the most, which one is it? Uh, probably the gym. <laughs> Let's just say they're going to make, they're going to take your life story and turn it into a Hollywood movie. Who would you want to play you in your film biopic? Um, oh boy, that is a good question. Uh, probably um, uh, Tom Hardy, other Tom one-on-one -on -one dinner date with anyone dead or alive who would you break bread with uh one one of the most uh interesting people i know um justice uh, marie sinclair can you think if you step outside your office and you find a lottery ticket that ends up winning 10 million dollars what mm -hmm. would you do with that money We'd be uh, investing that in business and figuring out how we create more impact for our communities. You're driving in your car. What do you think about most when you're alone? Uh, either uh, the honeydew list from my wife uh, or uh, what's on the agenda for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and now we come to something that's a bit of a tradition here on the Leadership Standard. It's, we call it the Lipton Pivot Survey. It honors French journalist Bernard Pivot, as well as James Lipton, the host of Inside the Actors Studio. Thomas Benjo, are you ready? Sure. What is your favorite word? Uh, favorite word? Uh, impact. What is your least favorite word? No. <laughs> what turns you on? Um, seeing indigenous people succeed. What turns you off? Uh, Probably listening to all the uh, all the tough stories about my own people and in, in uh, uh, on the news when we're flipping through the news channel, that's the most frustrating. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, anything just classical. That's uh, actually on uh, the playlist as of late. Is just listening to just soft classical music. What sound or noise do you hate? Ah, uh, that alarm in the morning. What is your favorite curse word? Ah, uh, damn. What profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? Ah, uh, probably legal. What profession under no circumstances would you never like to do? Not much for being a butcher. <laughs> if heaven exists, what do you hope our heavenly father says when you arrive at the pearly gates? Ah, you did a good job. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job on this podcast. And so, that leads me to see if you can capture, Thomas, before we wrap up, seven generations ahead. Take us into the crystal ball of FHQ developments and see if you can tell us and show us and take us on that journey of what seven generations ahead looks like. 
Well, seven generations ahead means that, uh, you know, our, our organization is at the center of uh, building an Indigenous business ecosystem that, uh, you know, helps to uh, build an understanding of uh, the importance of Indigenous knowledge and thought and uh, sustainability in, in the businesses that uh, we're involved with. And this means not only um, just for Indigenous business ownership, but non-Indigenous business ownership, that they take uh, what we are doing as an organization and realizing that uh, there's value, there is great value in our thought process and that those organizations want to mirror um, our thought process on, on why sustainability is important. Um, being at the center of the ecosystem of Indigenous business also means that we are creating opportunities even when we're not focused on creating those opportunities. And so when we think about our entrepreneurs and our communities, when we think about other nations doing business, that they are following what we are doing and that we are creating more opportunities for them. Um, that is where, you know, we see ourselves and, you know, seven generations ahead is being that that focal point of business and being able to say, hey, we you know we could take a look around and see great success um, within the economy and, and say, hey, you know what we we helped to start that, we helped to set that foundation, and we're helping to uh, continue to advance it. And and if you if you had a personal creed or motto, four or five words you live by, in other words, Thomas Ben Joe's ultimate legacy, what would it be? Um, do things with the greatest impact. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We really appreciate having Thomas Benjo joining us today uh, here on the Leadership Standard. And if you want to know more about Tech Canada and its world-class programs, uh, just go to the website, www.techtec-canada.com. What was it that Thomas spoke of that made you stop and think? My biggest takeaway, and I was hanging on his every word, was the power of any leader to really listen, to listen before speaking. But what was yours? Feel free to share your thoughts with me. My direct email is gair, G-A-I-R, at garamaxwell.com. And if you enjoyed the Leadership Standard here with Thomas Benjo, feel free to share with others in your online social networks. There are great things ahead for Thomas and FHQ Developments. And we're just so fortunate that we were able to uh, basically grab lightning in a bottle and see what's possible seven generations ahead. So yes, feel free, like, subscribe, share, and who knows, maybe we inspire someone else to grab hold of the clutch, kick it up a gear and go full throttle in this new frontier. On behalf of everyone at Tech Canada, the head office in Calgary and the technical crew uh, that makes this possible, thanks so much for joining us here on the Leadership Standard.